one thing that jumped out to me was this idea of training. It kept coming up, training your mind, training your mind, that there is an element of, well, this is a muscle. How do I work out my mental wellness? Coming up, we have Dr. Deborah Gilbo who teaches how to train the muscle of resilience. And this is another thing that you think, just like mental wellness isn't, like, like um, Dr. Williams said, it, it's a spectrum, it's a continuum. Uh, resilience is something that you know, Dr. Gilbo was actually um, educating me on just minutes before we started, that it's something that you're not just born with, it's not just something that's innate. You can actually develop it, and we're gonna learn exactly how. So to give you an idea of um, this upcoming panel of how student athletes are starting to communicate their journeys and how they are training their mental wellness and, and trying to inspire other people to realize that, hey, this is a path towards light that we can take together. How do we do that? Uh, let me introduce you to Deborah, Deborah Gilboa. So she's a resilience expert. Um, her nickname is Dr. G, which is a wonderful nickname. So Dr. G works with families, organizations, and businesses to identify the mindset and strategies to turn stress to an advantage. Uh, renowned for her contagious humor, Dr. G works with groups across multiple generations to rewire their attitudes and beliefs and create resilience through personal accountability and a completely different approach to adversity. She's a leading media personality seen regularly on shows like Today, Good Morning America, and The Doctors. She's also fre featured frequently in The Washington Post, The New York Times, Authority Magazine, and countless other digital and print outlets. Uh, Dr. G is, board certified, uh, is a board certified attending family physician and is fluent in American Sign Language. She lives in Pittsburgh with her four sons. Without any further ado, please welcome Dr. G to the stage. Okay, this is such an opportunity for us to think about what is it that we can do for students. We are, we are educators and adults at home and coaches and administrators and we have influence on everything from policy to going to practice and what you're gonna do at practice. But one of the things that we know is that this conversation cannot happen unless we learn to listen before we speak. Joining me today are three incredible athletes, and I'd like to invite them to come on up. <laughs> sit wherever you want to sit. Awesome. In just a minute, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, because that's so much more interesting. Corey mentioned that we were going to talk about resilience. So I want to define resilience before we get into our conversation. Resilience, when I ask students that I work with to define resilience, because students are really used to being asked to define words. Teachers often in elementary, middle, high school get up and they're like, we're gonna talk about this, what is this? And while a part of their brain is like, you brought us here, what do you mean what is this? They get it, and so students will often say, well, resilience is the ability to bounce back after something bad happens. When I'm working with elementary schoolers, I say that is 100% correct if you're a rubber band. Are you a rubber band? And they like to say, no, we're people. And I say, right. So people don't bounce back to being just like before anything happened to them. Resilience is the ability to navigate change and come through it the kind of person you want to be. All change, not just adversity or struggle or an obstacle or a difficulty or an injury or an illness or a failure. It's actually the ability to navigate all change. Dr. Williams mentioned that our nervous system has these overriding functions. Our brain has a million functions. As she mentioned, we're doing a whole bunch of them right now while we're sitting still. But what the, the main overriding purpose is to keep us alive. Good news, we are all currently alive. Box checked, accomplished. The bad news, all change is suspect. Every single change that we encounter, even if we're excited about it, even if we make the team, make the playoffs, find out we got the opportunity we really wanted to get or the relationship we really wanted to get or the teacher, whatever, our brain is like, oh, fantastic, pride, joy, excitement, relief. Also, though, could we die? <laughs> Every single time our brain says, cool, could we die, though? And it has these reflexes to jump in and be like, hang on, what could we lose? Do we trust this? What's going to be uncomfortable about it? So what we're really talking about is navigating change. With that context, I'm gonna start way down at that end. Jeff, will you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, of course. Hey, everybody, good morning. <laughs> I know we're still waking up, get your coffee and everything. Um, my name is Jeff Kelly. 
Uh, I graduated from UCCS, finished my MBA uh, back in May of this year. Uh, so it's good to be done with school. Uh, originally from Aurora, Colorado, which is about an hour north of here. Um, have two amazing parents, have an amazing family up there who, who made me who I am today, right? It's fantastic. Um, growing up, big basketball player, tried every other sport and it wasn't for me. Basketball was my thing. Um, you know, played all the way, obviously, up through college. Um, went to a high school up in Aurora, which is known for, for basketball. It's a uh, private school, is a predominantly white school, which, you know, as you guys can see, that's only half of me, right? And uh, something for me was, hey, I was a basketball player that was, was different than everybody else, right? So growing up, you know, was, was a good basketball player, and I just felt in my head that everything that I did was magnified, right? Whether it was good, whether it was bad, whether it was on the court, whether it was in the classroom, whether it was in the community, everybody knew about it somehow, right? Somehow everybody figured it out. Um, and, you know, that's kind of just how it was, right? So I ended up, you know, being fortunate to get a scholarship to come play basketball out here in Springs. Um, and it was fantastic. Loved it. Uh, started some games my freshman year. Started some games my sophomore year. Uh, got about eight games through the year. And, you know, it was the practice before that eighth game. Went up for a, I got a steal, went up for a layup. My knee hyperextended and locked up, right? But, of course, me, I was like, ah. Okay, that doesn't feel good. You know, that's, that's not right. Um, so ended up just putting some ice on it. We had a game the next day. I was like, all right, I'm gonna play the game. Talked to the trainer and got some ibuprofen. Uh, one minute into the game, first possession, had the ball, drove to the middle. My knee kept going that way. My body tried to go that way. Wasn't good, right? Tore my ACL and, and messed up a whole bunch of other stuff in there. Um, unfortunately, played one game too many, so I couldn't get a medical redshirt that year. Um, so I ended up missing that whole year. Uh, you know, the next summer we were going to Australia to play a couple games, and I've been doing rehab, been practicing, been ready to go. Uh, first game out there in Australia, knee blew up again, right? Nobody knew what was going on. Um, just a whole bunch of uh, inflation in there that wasn't good. Couldn't even put my brace on. Um, so I ended up coming back, had to get two more knee surgeries, missed a whole another year. Luckily, I was able to get a medical red shirt, but um, in my mind, didn't make it any easier, right? Missed a year and a half of playing basketball. Um, for me, you know, I've always been a vocal leader, always been a leader on the court. Like I said, I thought everything that I did was magnified. So the fact that I wasn't on the court, the fact that I wasn't able to be there with my teammates, be there with my brothers, I felt like my voice was taken away. Didn't know who I was um, and, and really just felt lost, right? And felt like nobody else knew what I was going through, right? So I ended up getting back and I just remember one day, one of my assistant coaches, you know, he texted me. Our team had been blown out out in Nebraska and we were going to play CSU Pueblo the next day. And he's like, Jeff, can you just drive down and meet us there? Like, we just need you. And that was the biggest thing for me to hear, to be like, hey, I can't be on the court, but I can still be, you know, bring value to our team, right? Um, so that was the biggest turning point for me, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, like I said, I just finished, grad or graduated in May, and now I do uh, financial literacy for a lot of student athletes, a lot of inner city kids here in Colorado Springs and, and up in Denver. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Charlie, how about you? Hi, so my name is Charlie Nordeen. Uh, I'm a Paralympic silver medalist, uh, originally from Oakland, California. Um, my whole life, I've seen myself as an athlete. It's been such an integral part of my identity, which I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to. Uh, grew up playing soccer, in high school transitioned to track and field and absolutely fell in love with like a power endurance sport. Um, when I was 16, I fell off a rope swing and essentially shattered my L3, L4, and L5 vertebrae. Um, I was in a wheelchair for multiple months, uh, couldn't move my legs for a while. It resulted in permanent nerve damage to my right leg. I can't feel my right leg at all. My right glute, hamstring, and calf basically don't work at all. Those nerves were essentially severed. Um, so that was really hard because, again, as I mentioned, my whole identity was around being an athlete. That's who I was. I'm sure if you're a high school coach, every high school athlete dreams about going D1. And at the time, I was a junior, and it was right when recruiting had started. I was starting to talk to some Division I coaches, and, you know, that was the dream. And then to not only have that taken away, but to not even be able to walk, like very basic things. Like I was having a hard time eating, I couldn't really put my shoes on, I couldn't stand up. It completely reshaped my vision of who I was, how I saw myself. Um, so kind of definitely struggled through senior year, not being an athlete, 
and then through just a lot of intensive rehab, uh, I went to Gonzaga uh, just as a student, and by chance, the assistant coach uh, reached out to me, he saw me around campus, knew that I was tall, it helps to be tall as a rower, uh, and asked, he was like, have you ever thought about rowing? And I really honestly had never. I didn't know much about the sport, but I was still, that dream was still lingering in the back of my mind of being a Division I athlete, of having that opportunity to compete at a higher level. So when he gave it, I wasn't even sure with my disability, with my back, if it was a possibility, but as soon as he gave that opportunity, I just jumped on it. Uh, absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I quickly found sport, rowing specifically, to be a big source of healing mentally for me from this injury because I was an athlete again, because I was finally achieving these dreams. Um, kind of kept rowing, fell in love with it, just absolutely committed myself fully to it. Uh, three years later, had the opportunity to make my first national team. Uh, went to Worlds, that was the biggest honor ever, getting to represent uh, the United States of America on the world stage, and that's when the fire really, really was lit, uh, and then kind of committed my life fully. I graduated in 2019. After graduation, uh, signed a professional rowing contract, and just spent the next two years, what was supposed to be a year, ended up being two years with the pandemic, uh, training full time, uh, got to go to Tokyo, uh, didn't do too bad, got a silver medal, which again was the biggest honor. <laughs> um, finished that and then had the opportunity to go to Trinity, Trinity in uh, Dublin, Ireland for my master's. Uh, got the opportunity, got a scholarship there to row. Uh, got my master's in sociology um, and I'm really, really passionate about mental health, especially at that high school age because I struggled so much for variety of reasons, and we talk about resilience a fair bit, and I think athletes are almost too good at being resilient. I think we're really good at putting our head down and just pushing through a workout, whatever it might be, and in certain aspects, that's awesome. You know, like, it's sport. You do have to push yourself. You do have to struggle through things, but taking that mentality and applying it to the realm of mental health is not the right formula, and it's the one that I did for so long, so I'm really excited to be here today to speak with you, to speak with the kids back home, and share a couple of the lessons I learned from a lot of the missteps that I made. So thank you for having me. Kayleen. Hi, uh, my name is Kayleen Bracken. I'm 20, I am a member of the Vanderbilt University women's lacrosse team, so I'm currently living in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I grew up originally in Northeastern New Jersey. I grew up playing a few sports. Honestly, I was never super crazy about like the total like three sport athlete crazy seasons. I was really into gymnastics, um, really into competitive cheerleading, and then my dad and his whole family played lacrosse. So I grew up in a lacrosse family and I always knew that was gonna be a part of my life. Um, so when I was probably like five or six, I picked up lacrosse and I kind of never looked back after that. I, I loved gymnastics, I loved competitive cheerleading, I played soccer, um, but lacrosse was always what I knew I was gonna pursue and I, I just saw myself so deeply as a lacrosse player. So I felt like ingrained in who I was um, and in my relationship with my family and all of my relatives and it, it felt like a really amazing um, kind of path that was already paved for me and so I felt really lucky to go down that and I did throughout many years of my life. I was totally dedicated, I was out in the snow, it would be like five o'clock in the morning, I was doing wall ball and I would drop the 49th pass and I would start over, which is a little bit neurotic but I think to Charlie's point, like resilience, sometimes we're a little bit too resilient, like I'm, I was being late to school because I was out on the wall and it was like 30 degrees in New Jersey. And so growing up I had a really incredible lacrosse career, I had all these amazing teams, I had really cool opportunities to meet people all over the country and meet wonderful coaches and mentors and when I got to high school, I kind of started getting this recognition for being um, you know, an outstanding lacrosse player in, in that realm, which was amazing. And it felt really validating and special to be the one sport I had dedicated myself to, to be experiencing all of these rewards and recognition for it. And come junior, senior year, I started to kind of struggle with my mental health and I started struggling with my identity as an athlete. And I felt like I had to choose. I felt like I had to choose whether I wanted to be an athlete or whether I wanted to be just like a regular student and I remember all my friends were applying to a bunch of colleges and they were all complaining about how they had no idea where they were going to get in and I had committed to Vanderbilt when I was a junior and I was almost like I'm kind of jealous that they get to do this whole 
human experience of applying to all these schools. Meanwhile, like I was only applying to one school. I was pretty sure about that I would get in, which was really awesome, and I'm really lucky. I'm on scholarship, so it's an incredible opportunity in a lot of ways. Um, but still, there was that polarity of being like, can I be both of these things? And, and at 17, 18, I didn't understand that I could. That was something that I only learned a year and a half, two years ago. So I basically got to college, and I'd been struggling my whole senior year with my mental health, and, and without acknowledging that it was my mental health, like I was struggling with an eating disorder, and I was struggling with a bout of depression. That was my first time really dealing with those things. And then going into college in 2020 was not exactly priming me for success. <laughs> because What could have possibly gone wrong? <laughs> right, right. And so it was, it was isolating inherently. Um, and then when I got to school, it was just a really tumultuous path of, of kind of going back and forth with myself and with my parents and my support system and coaches and being like, I don't, I don't think I'm like fully ready to be here yet. And I think I need to do some more you know, self-exploration in a way and go home and really heal. And so I went home for a little bit, ended up coming back to school about a month later. I was like, all right, I'm ready to go. And I keep saying, I, I felt like I was almost like a loaf in the oven at the time, and I kept taking myself out before I was ready. Like, I was just not fully cooked. And then I was surprised every time that I was like, why isn't this working? And so I ended up coming back my first semester of college and being like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to opt back onto the team. I'm set to go. And then the spring season came and I was in eating disorder recovery and I was dealing with my mental health and therapy, and which is a full-time job. And, and luckily, so is being a Division I athlete. And so I was kind of juggling these things um, all while trying to navigate, like exploring this identity of wanting to be both an athlete and a competitor and also being like a really soft, introspective human and friend outside of it and exploring those other things that I'm interested in. And so end of my freshman year of college, I was still having a really hard time performance-wise and just finding my sense of belonging on my team and as an athlete. And I felt such a pull to explore other areas of my life, and I, I really did. I felt like I had to choose one or the other. Um, and so I ended up getting a concussion at the end of my freshman year, and that to me was kind of symbolic of like, okay, take a step back because this is actually impacting your brain and your mind more than you actually have given it credit for. And so being able to take that time, and I took a month I left school early, I took a month off the team, and I was just with my parents talking through these things, and it was just like a series of uncomfortable conversations, and I do like to think that uncomfortable conversations are the measure of a meaningful life, and it was just amazing to talk to my coaches and my parents, and, and I really felt like I had to mature pretty quickly in that sense of looking at like really realistic things like finances, like what does it look like if you lose your scholarship and you're not playing a sport anymore? That's something you have to consider down the line, and like, What's my relationship with my teammates if I'm not on the team anymore, or my coaches, or the connections I've made through the lacrosse community? And I think that was a huge deal. And I ended up taking that month, and I was pretty intentional. And I did, you know, the journaling, the meditating, and it's it's still integral to my kind of journey. Those things and those wellness practices. But when I was a month out of that experience, I was like, you know what? I I want to try again. And I was coming at it from a totally different perspective, a different approach. Uh, with new intentions of just being the best teammate that I could be and being the most supportive person on the field or on the bench in the locker room. Um, and coming back at it with that mindset was incredible. And I also developed amidst this time this incredible passion for mental health and for talking about our minds and our hearts and our experiences really openly and honestly. And I'm also a writer. And so I started writing about these things. And I actually had never written about sports. Like, people joke that people who followed my um, social media didn't know I played a sport because I talked about it so rarely. And then I, um, last April, after Katie Meyer died, who was a uh, women's soccer player at Stanford, I wrote an article called A Letter to College Sports. And I wrote it for The Mental Matchup, which is a wonderful, um, the blog section of Morgan's Message, which is a really wonderful um, nonprofit for mental health. and to prevent suicide. It's really, really cool. If anyone hasn't checked it out, I recommend it. Um, and it was picked up by US Lacrosse Magazine, which was so cool and surreal because obviously growing up as a lacrosse player, it's just like the most amazing honor to be featured in such a magazine. Um, and then it was cool. It kind of snowballed from there, and I got a, a good amount of recognition. The piece got the recognition. And I keep saying, like, honestly, anyone could have written that piece. I just happened to have been the one to string the words together. Um, it was a story of a lot of student athletes, but if anyone isn't familiar with it, it basically is um, like a 3,000 er word urge towards um, prioritizing the mental health of student athletes and what is um, 
a public crisis of mental health on college campuses and also just um, among all individuals. And so I now am here because of it and it's, I feel really grateful to be able to share not only my story but also to engage with other people's. It's a huge passion of mine to hear from other people and, and try to work with them on that and draw resonance between our experience, both as athletes and also people who don't play sports, people who just want to navigate life as a human being because there's so much similarity between those experiences. So I'm so psyched to be here and it's like so cool to be among such incredible athletes and such incredible people. It's just so exciting to see the activism coming um, to fruition in, in settings like these. It's so useful for us to hear your individual stories. And I just want to point out that you are not representing a minority of elite athletes. You're representing the majority, we know, of elite athletes who have felt mental health impact and at times mental health degradation from their athletic participation, even though we know that sport can be amazing in supporting and building and training up your mental health. So I wanna start with a question and I'm gonna start by asking you, Charlie, what's excellent about being involved in sport? For kids, particularly. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's an incredible community. Uh, the life skills you learn from it, the life lessons you learn from it, I carry with me that I learned, you know, as like a 10, 12-year-old. Some of the best friends I made growing up are still my best friends to this day. It gave me a structure, especially in high school, that I really needed, in college also, that I really thrived off of. Um, it did help my mental health in some ways. Uh, there were times where a lot was going on in life and that was my outlet, you know, is to go for a row or work out. Um, so I, I think sport can be excellent if done correctly, which again is why I'm passionate about talking about it because it can be a fine line between being really beneficial to your life and then all of a sudden taking a large toll on your mental health. And at times it can be both. Um, so it's a tricky thing to balance and I think it's really important to have these conversations. Kaylin, is there anything that you'd add about what you think is excellent for kids about being involved in sports? Yeah, I think, and Charlie said this at dinner last night, like, it kind of is a, it's, there's two sides of the coin of, like, sports can be this incredible connecting thing for children especially. Like, you're learning these really valuable and tangible lessons from people oftentimes that you respect and that you admire. And on the flip side, that's also where I think we learn to... Um, invest our validation or our worthiness in other people. And so when we're looking at our coaches and we're looking at the other older athletes that we think are so awesome that we want to be, we want to emulate, um, we can either learn from them or we can decide that if we don't meet their mark, that we're not as good as them or that we don't matter or that we're not worthy. And so what I think is so excellent about sport is that when you're given the right setting and the right coaches and the right community, it is like the most transforming thing. Some of my most treasured mentors and people that I've admired throughout my life have been my coaches. And there is really, really nothing better than a good coach. Similarly, there's really nothing worse than a bad coach. And so I think that, it, again, like it goes on both sides. And I personally think that sports have shown me, and you talked about this again last night, is like this difference between like, where is the comfort zone? And then where are we like, getting into this discomfort that's actually gonna force us to grow. And then where's the spot where we're like, okay, maybe this isn't safe anymore. And sports have taught me like, if my mind tells me to stop on this run or on this, in this game, in this sprint, and then my body's like, no, I, I can keep going. It's like teaching me that believing your thoughts is actually gonna be a detriment to yourself because when your thoughts are negative and you believe them to be true, that becomes something that manifests um, like in your reality. And so I think that Sports have taught me to trust both like my gut and my body, but also to engage with different challenges and actually try to understand, is this good for me? Is this serving me? Is this forcing me to grow? Or is this actually just something that I don't really need anymore? Excellent. Jeff, I wanna put that same question to you, but with a different lens. And that is, if you decided in your life to have kids, would you choose to engage them, to involve them in sport, even if you were watching them toddle around your house and they didn't have the best motor skills? You were like, I don't know that you're gonna be awesome at this. <laughs> yeah. Would you still engage them in sport? It's funny you bring that up because my parents are probably watching and they're like, Jeff couldn't tie his shoes until he was like seven, so. <laughs> um, no, it's funny. I, I think to, to these two, the points that these two made, you learn so much from sport that can help you in any aspect of life, right? Um, it, there's so much to it that makes you the best version of yourself, right? But I think to your, to your question, there's a fine line, right? If your kid, you know, if I were to have kids and I'd say like, I'm a big basketball guy, I'd love it if they played sports, right? I'd love it. But 
if I saw them try it and they were just like, dad, no, like this isn't for me. I think that's where a lot of parents today, um, I don't wanna say struggle, and I, I think we're getting better, but it's like, hey, I want this so bad for my kids because I've seen what it's done for me, right? I've seen how much I've grown from playing basketball, playing sports in my life. I want that same thing for them. And it's so hard to be like, okay, like, if, if it's not for you, it's not for you. I understand that. I think there's a lot of other outlets that can teach you a lot of the same things, right? So um, I, said, I, I would love my kids to play, for my kids to play sports, but it's not something that I'm like, hey, you have to do it. It's non-negotiable. So it's fascinating to me because each of you have had quantitative, looking in from the outside, successes in sport, and yet none of you said, well, it's great when you win. None of you talked about achievement. You talked about experience, you talked about effort, you talked about what you learned from it, and very few parents get their kids involved, very few adults, teachers, coaches, adults at home, get their kids involved in sport when they're young, right? Three, four, seven, ten, because they think they have the next Olympic gold medalist. Usually, the path is my kid has an interest or I see value in sport, so I my kid has been in the, in the water and they're a water baby, they love that, we'll look at a water sport. Or in my town, the accessible thing that we can do is soccer. Whatever the reasons are for which one we pick, we pick it for these purposes that you're talking about. What could my child learn from this? What could they experience? Does it help them to use their body? And does it teach them how to listen to an adult that isn't me? Will somebody else get them to find a way to motivate them? We involve them for all these really great reasons and then occasionally, a child shows themselves to have an affinity and a drive for something. But it's not usually the flip side, that first we see the affinity and drive and then we sign them up. Usually we sign them up for all these great reasons and that's what we wanted them to get from this. And it's really interesting and I think valuable for us to hear that for people who are still viewing themselves mostly as the athlete and not yet as the coach, the teacher, the adult at home, you're also talking about that purpose. So I wanna ask a question about identity. First, going back in your own memory, Jeff, when is a time, how do you, what do you think is the earliest time in your life where you started, where being an athlete started to be part of how you identified, how you related to people, how you thought of yourself? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, I, you know, Facebook is an amazing, I, I love Facebook, but they've recently started doing memories, and I get these memories from like 12 years ago when I was like in middle school, and they're, you know, everyone had those to be honest, right? Like this for a to be honest. And I was liking everyone, and literally, I'm looking back at those now, and every to be honest was like, hey, to be honest, Jeff, you're Wait, super nice. You gotta explain to some people who don't know what you're talking about what a to be honest was. <laughs> Let me back up, yeah. let me back up. So, we're talking about Facebook here, right? You can make a post, and back in, back in the day, some kids would you know, post something and say, hey, like this status for a to be honest, right? And basically, they would just tell you what they thought about you, right? So, of course, me on Facebook, I was on there, I'm liking everything, I wanna know what everybody thinks about me. And now I see that, I'm like, Every to be honest that I got was, to be honest, Jeff, you're super tall, you're super nice, and you're an amazing basketball player. And I, I think, you know, obviously that was in middle school, but for me, I, that's, that was me in elementary school. I started playing when I was four, and I think from that point on, like I was taller than everyone, I could get rebounds, I could pass the ball, I could make shots. So everyone knew Jeff the basketball player. So I mean, to answer your question, from as far as I can remember, that's kind of who I was, just a basketball player. Okay, and so I see Charlie and Kayleen, you're nodding, like yeah, it was, and so it was a part of your identity pretty young. Will you each tell me, Kayleen, will you tell me how old were you, do you think, when you, when being an athlete was part of, if somebody, if you met a cousin at a family reunion and they're like, oh, tell me about you, that you, that athlete would have been part of what you said? Yeah, I think among other things, and we, we said yesterday, I was telling them that I, as a young child, was more so pursuing like being the next Hannah Montana, and over the years, I was like, okay, well, like, I, I like the attention coming in different places. Um, and I think that the spotlight was something I was interested in, just like generally as a, as a child. Like I saw all these amazing, I remember just like so many incredible gymnasts, um, like Sean Johnson. I was like, I wanna be Sean Johnson. And like I loved seeing all of these athletes. And so when I was associated, like, oh, if my, if my family was like, oh, how's gymnastics going? Or how's cheer, how's, how's lacrosse? it became something that I was like, they associate me with this and they, you know, they afford value to me because 
I'm doing these things, and, and I was thinking about what Jeff is saying, like, there's this theory in sociology called the theory of the looking glass self, and it's, this is gonna be a little bit of a mind game. It says, I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. So what people project onto you, like those TBHs, and that is definitely a, um, a generational phenomenon, <laughs> but those things. That stands for to be honest. To be honest. <laughs> And uh, it's interesting because, like, I would get those too, and when people are like, oh, you're so good at lacrosse, like, you're the best lacrosse player. I would be like, the more that you hear those things, the more you internalize it, and then you, more you project those things right back to them. So same thing goes for, like, when I would talk to my family about sports, and they're like, hey, you're an athlete, you're an athlete. I would be like, okay, I'm an athlete. And then, and then this kind of veil closes, and you're like, what else am I? Because if I'm just an athlete, and if everyone else believes I'm just an athlete, maybe that's what I should stick with because it's easiest and that's what other people think I am. Um, and so I think it was kind of an exploration of like even just at such a young age of, of wanting to get dressed up in like the shiny leotard. I remember that was like a huge draw for me. And then- Cause get, you were four. Cause, yeah. Exactly, okay. exactly, no, totally. I mean, four, <laughs> 10, same thing. But like, I, uh, same thing with lacrosse. Like I remember wanting to put on the goggles and like get out there and throw on the eye black and, and compete and get all this recognition. And also just like actually kind of separate myself from who I was in like the classroom and who I was at home and, and all of that and just be my own person. And I think at like five, six, seven years old, that's a huge deal to have the independence of stepping onto the court or getting on the water or getting on like the track or getting on the field. And you have this moment to be like, I'm 10 years old and I'm, I'm kind of, pardon my language, I'm kind of a badass. Like I'm, I'm really taking this yeah, you are. For myself, and, and that's why I think why parents kind of see that as like, that's awesome, like that's what you're learning is like this sense of independence and the sense of kind of getting to know yourself um, on and off the field. Okay, so when did your identity as an athlete translate to your worth as a person? Oh man, like too early. It, and it's like, it shouldn't be that way, but I mean, just as uh, these two, like for as long as I can remember, my identity has been surrounded around being an athlete. And as it was happening, I didn't even know it was happening, but it was just the social circles I was in, what I was doing on the weekend, what I was doing after school. And very quickly, uh, my worth started to be tied to like, okay, well, what place were you in the race? You know, like, well, how fast is your mile? Well, are you going to go to college for athletics? And I didn't, again, realize it at the time. And I think none of my teammates did either, but we were putting a lot of pressure on ourselves and a lot of like, if I don't do this, I'm not good enough, which is just ridiculous because athletics is such a small part of who you are as an overall person. And as you get older, it's a little bit easier to realize that, but in the moments, especially in high school, it's everything. Um, and again, it wasn't until my injury where I couldn't be an athlete anymore. It wasn't about like, you know, how fast can you run a mile? It was about, well, can you get out of wheelchair? Can you walk again? That I really went into a pretty intense depressive episode and a lot of it was tied to the fact that I wasn't an athlete anymore. And where I found my worth, where I found so much of my value was gone and I didn't know how to approach that. And it's something I still struggle with a little bit because even now it's kind of, crazy and a little bit ironic, the more you achieve in sport and the older you get, the more that gets placed on you. And it wasn't until I went to get my master's degree and started like focusing on something else in my life that I was like, I'm not just a rower, you know, like I have other aspects of my life, like I'm not just a Paralympian. Uh, and that has been great for my mental health and it's really helped my relationship with rowing and with sport because it's not all I put my worth in. It's not the only thing I have going for me. And I really hope other people can start to see that too because it is hard when what feels like everything you're passionate about, everything you really like, all your friends really like is sport to pull yourself out of that a little bit and be like, well, no, like I'm a whole person too. I'm not just an athlete is really important. It's really important, and one of the things I want to ask you each to think about and for us to talk about right now is what do the adults in a student athlete's life, what opportunity do they have, what do they need to do, or what can they do to help the athlete see the value of taking on that identity as part of their identity and steer them away from the danger of making it their whole identity and tying it to their value as a human tying it to their worth. Jeff, I'd love to ask you to think for a minute about when you were injured mm -hmm. 
and, and I'm not asking you to say who because you said your parents are watching, but can you think about who tried to convince you that this didn't diminish your worthiness and what helped or, or when that conversation should have started if it was too late then or what, can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my parents definitely played a huge role in that. They did and they were amazing and I think my athletic trainer was another person who was fantastic. And then I had two coaches. Like, I, I had a great support system around me. Um, I think for me and, and for coaches as I kind of transition into that world, I think it really revolves around the culture that you had, kind of have in your program and in sports in general, right? Because like we've been talking about, you know, in sports, the culture that we're taught from a young age is, hey, figure out a way, find a way, right? Whatever it takes, find a way, right? Whether it's finishing a workout, whether it's winning a game, whether it's diving on a loose ball, whatever it is, find a way, right? And I think for me, that was so ingrained in my head, find a way to get through it. Find a way to sit, I mean, do what you gotta do, right? And you know, it doesn't matter what you're thinking, what you're feeling, find a way. And I think you know, as we kind of transition you know, and, and start talking more about this, it's really we need to shift that culture um, to where we're teaching these kids at a younger age, hey, we tell you this, we find a way, right? But you know, it's not all on you, right? So uh, I think for me, you know, when I was injured, Everyone around me did was amazing. I think for me, it was just so ingrained in my head. And that was you know, from years and years and years and years and years, and probably more years of self-talk, of saying, hey, Jeff, you're okay. You don't need anybody to tell you. They're, what are they gonna tell you? They're gonna tell you exactly what you already know. Just do it. And I think that was just me putting it on myself. Um, so if we can change that narrative to start talking to these kids at a younger age, like, hey, sometimes you just need to get it out there. Sometimes you just need to talk about it then you know, they don't have all those years of just thinking about it and you know, holding it on their cells and holding that burden by themselves. Uh, so I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, to kind of jump in on that a little bit, yeah. sometimes finding a way is taking a step back. Mm. And sometimes the hardest and the strongest thing that you can do as an athlete is take time for yourself. I know it might feel like you're giving up. I know it might feel like you're being weak, but it's not the case. I mean, if anything, sticking through it and not being your best self for your team, for your coaches, for yourself, because you're not mentally there, because you're pushing through this thing, it's a disservice to everyone, especially yourself. Um, so as a coach or as a parent, uh, I think it's really important to be understanding. And again, it's a fine balance of encouraging your kid to push through these hard times, but also understanding if they need to take a step back, if they need to take some time for themselves, to approach this, to navigate this, especially at a high school age. I mean, I think what's so tricky about that age is for a lot of kids, it's the first time they're having these feelings. It's the first time these emotions are starting to play a predominant role in their life. And because it is the first time, they don't have a lot of skills on how to deal with them. They don't know how to navigate these feelings. And us as adults, as role models, I mean, some of my biggest role models in my life were my coaches. If you can approach it with empathy and understanding and offer some tools to help them get through it, it really, really can go a long way. Because again, the feelings are there, but the tools and how to navigate them aren't usually at this age. Kayleen, what you just talked about a little bit ago about that what's important, what, what I believe about me is what I believe you believe about me. That's more true for adolescents than it is for fully baked adults, right? People are ready to come out of the oven. Right. And it is there, the neuroreceptors and the chemicals that are running around in adolescent brains are hyper vigilant about how they believe they are perceived by others. It's often way more important than the facts about how they're perceived by themselves or by others. And so, there is, it's like you're, it's like you've got thinner skin towards how you're perceived by others. And so how do we as adults involved in student athletes' lives teach them to be a little critical of who they let in, who they give that power to? And, um, to th and I don't mean critical like, nasty judgmental, I mean like to critique, to, to decide who's worthy of getting to speak that into you and who and how to be like, I appreciate that that is how you feel, but I don't have to value that opinion. I don't have to give weight 
to that opinion. Is there a way to speak that into somebody who is in middle or high school, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think you could even replace the word critical with intentional. Like being intentional about who you let into your orbit, and that's something I've, I feel like over the past few years I've really, really honed in on is like, who gets my energy? And, and whose energy am I willing to accept? And whose energy do I have enough respect for that person to actually accept? And if I wouldn't go to somebody for advice, I'm not gonna listen really, really and internalize what they have to say if they're just coming at me with that. And I think something, and this has kind of been talked about a lot in these conversations, is like coaches need therapists too. And so when I have like a coach or you know any really uh, mentor in my life who's kind of coming at me with something that I feel like crosses my boundaries of what I'm willing to accept um, energetically or even if it just emotionally is like wounding and I'm like, this is not gonna serve me accepting this. Um, I, I really do think that drawing the line and just saying as even a parent, I think teaching your child to navigate those conversations, I think oftentimes as children, I know I felt this way, like a coach sits you down and they tell you something and you take it as the truth, that you take it as fact. You don't factor in what's going on in their personal life, what they might be projecting, what their intention of the conversation is, if they even have a clear intention or if they're kind of just coming at you with what they think you need to hear. Um, so I think as a parent going to your kid and saying like, hey, who right now are you letting into your orbit? Going through that list and then saying, how do these people make you feel? Because there are people in my, in my orbit now who make me feel like I'm a superstar like who make me feel like I am a celebrity when I walk into the room, and it is just the most incredible feeling. Is it tied to how well you're succeeding in your sport? No, not at all. It's like, you woke up. Look at you, like, it's, <laughs> it's so awesome. Yes, you're yeah, killing it. Right, like I could step out looking totally like disheveled, and everyone's like, those people are there who like, they couldn't care less about the external, about the things that I've racked up on like a resume. Like those resume values, do not matter. It's like the eulogy values, if you've ever read The Road to Character. It's like, what's somebody gonna say about you at your funeral? Like, nobody's gonna be like, she had so many goals. She ran a really great 40 yard dash. You know, like people are gonna say, she was an incredible friend. She was a wonderful mentor. She was somebody I connected with, I felt seen by. And so I think finding, like talking to your kids and saying like, how does this person make you feel? Because I had some pretty gnarly coaches growing up and if my parents, I think my parents did a good job of sitting me down and being like, okay, like, how do they make you feel? And I'm like, they felt made me feel small. They made me feel like I was crazy. They made me feel like I was wrong, like I wasn't worthy. And those are the people that you say, okay, as a parent, I'm gonna teach you, and I'm not a parent, so don't take this as advice like Bible, but, um, <laughs> but I think as a parent, you can go to your kid and say like, all right, let's learn how to navigate those conversations. And if I were, coaching and, and a 13 year old came up to me and said, hey, what you said to me the other day, it really crossed an emotional boundary that I have and I feel like what you said is actually isn't gonna serve me as a player. So I wanna sit down with you and figure out a way where you can communicate with me in a way that makes me a better player and makes you feel like the best coach you can be, the best parent you can be, the best mentor you can be. And I think it's like amazing that when you actually are both on the same page about that, the communication flows so well because there's an open channel, but when it's like, student athletes sits quietly and listens and be, is talked at, it just is never gonna serve anyone and then you just come away from that sport or that experience with resentment and it doesn't serve anyone. I think a lot of adults might be thinking, boy, if I could teach my 13 year old to say any of those things, that would really feel like a huge win. But it's also important for us to remember and to teach the kids in our lives that knowing how they feel about something, even if they're not at a place with that person or with themselves where they could sit and speak that truth to that person, Knowing it, being able to tell one trusted person that that's how they feel, that is really valuable. That will strengthen them in that moment. It will change their inner self-talk from, boy, I'm, I'm smaller than I thought, I'm worse than I thought, I'm less worthy than I thought, to, oh, this is one of those moments that my person, my adult, whatever, would ask me, boy, what's going on for them? <laughs> this sounds hard for them, but, I'm not sure it's true for me. And just being able to question, even if a part of you is still like, are they right? I better check in with somebody else to see if they're right. Being able to just question, is that person in authority, could they be wrong? That's a revolutionary question. They might be right. It's absolutely true that they might be correct, but their delivery might be really damaging. What are the problems with tough love coaching? 
Jeff, will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think there's a fine line, like we've been talking about, there's a fine line, a really fine line with it, because to you guys' points, I'm sure we've all had coaches that have given us some tough love, and to your point, you know, just presented it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you're not, you're not doing good enough. You're not doing good enough. And I remember growing up, hearing that, you know, I was harder on myself than they were on me. So him telling me that, oh, that was terrifying. That was terrible, right? It took me out forever. Um, I think, you know, to your point, I think it, it builds off the relationship, right? If you are that mentor in their life, that you have a relationship with them, that you are the trusted person that they can go to and that they know that, right? And they're not just saying, oh, yeah, like, I, I trust you because you're my parent and, like, I'm supposed to love you, right? Like, I know I love you. Thanks. But if you're actually that person and you can actually have those conversations and they feel comfortable going to you, then I think that tough love can be there and presented the right way, right? But if you're just someone in their life where they're, you know, they see you and you take them to practice and, you know, that relationship just isn't built yet, right? And it's, it's hard. Like Kayleen said, it's, you know, the tough conversations are hard to have, but you got to have them at some point, right? Um, if you have done those things, I think tough love is, is great because I think a lot of learning comes from being uncomfortable but it really just stems on that relationship. And if that relationship is not there, it's, it's tough. So I see you both nodding at what Jeff's saying, that maybe one of the things we need to look at as that person in authority in an athlete's life as needing to earn, mm -hmm. to prove that we're invested enough that it would be worth listening to? Yeah, I think it has to come from a place of caring too. I mean, there are times in my life where I really needed tough love, and it was great. I mean, I was just not, you know, getting into By trouble. By great, do you mean it was terrible? Well, <laughs> well I was being terrible. <laughs> having, having a coach give me tough love was really beneficial, but what made it so great was because I knew it was coming from a place of caring. I knew it was, at the end of the day, love. And I feel like that can be hard to convey, but it is essential to convey because then... I never walked away from these conversations being like, oh, he's picking on me or he just doesn't like me or whatever because I knew he really just wanted what was best for me. And if you can find a way to make that clear, it's essential. Um, and honestly, I've had coaches that were really good at it, coaches that were really bad at it. The coaches that made sure I knew that it was coming from a place of caring I was so much more likely to listen to. I was so much more likely to take to heart what they were saying and move forward with it. So even just on like a basic level, like it's much more effective. Like kids are going to listen to you if they know that at the end of the day, you have their best intention at heart. How? How did the coaches that let you know that it was coming from a place of caring, what did they do or say or show that let you know that? Yeah. Um, Gosh, I think, so my sophomore year of college, because uh, of my back injury, I had uh, steel rods put into my spine. And at the time, I wasn't a rower, so my neurosurgeon didn't think it would be a problem. Rowing is a very back-dominant sport. Me, just not thinking, being a freshman in college, was like, I'll do rowing, I don't have to consult with anybody. Caught up to me a year later, I actually broke one of the rods in my back. Um, broke a steel <laughs> rod. Yeah, it was, wow. uh, okay. it was a rough day. Um, <laughs> so I was basically out for the whole next year. And because I wasn't rowing, I was like still a part of the team, but I didn't feel like as an active part of the team. And I kind of quickly became a negative influence on the team because I wasn't focused. I didn't have goals to work for. I was definitely distracting other guys on the team. I was like, oh, I know you have practice tomorrow, but like, let's go out and party because like, I don't have to work out tomorrow. So, but, which again, wasn't great, but uh, my assistant coach called me in and what really struck with me was he opened the conversation is, um, he said, Charlie, I know you can be a better version of yourself than you're being right now. And I want nothing more than for you to actualize that. And then I felt like so guilty. I was like, oh my, I'm so sorry, you know? And then we got into it and then some tough love did come across of like, you know, if you're just gonna be this kid that's dragging all my, you know, athletes out to parties every Saturday, like I'm gonna cut you from the team. You know, like you're not, you're not gonna have a spot on this team anymore. But again, like knowing that he wanted me to be my best self and he knew, and I knew it too, that I was falling short of that, uh, completely set the tone for the conversation and I was so receptive to it because I, again, I looked up to him, I still look up to him and it was a really important conversation. We 
have all acknowledged one way or another that athletic training can be really uncomfortable. I look at some of the training that each of you have done for your sport and I think, you call that discomfort, like, oh, that was hard, I had to push through it. I would call it actual torture. <laughs> Everybody's got a different line. But at some point, to your point, discomfort becomes unsafe. Discomfort becomes danger. This is something that Simone Biles spoke about really eloquently a year and a half ago. That is a person who, by all accounts, has been through discomfort that most of us would consider impossible uh, and still said, yep, I will push through, deal with, handle, wait, nope, red line. This is the line you can't cross. And when I heard that, what I thought as the mom of four kids was, boy, how do I teach my kids that? And by that, I mean both the, the, the drive and the willingness to put up with discomfort, to see the value, to listen to my body, to know when to listen to my thoughts or when they're more trying to just take the easy way out and I should grab whatever, uh, whatever fortitude I have and push through. And when is it actually potentially dangerous to my body or my mind and I need to advocate for myself? And that's what pushing through looks like. It looks like being like, oh, time out. I need a defibrillator and like shock this whole thing into a new rhythm. Can you think of anything in your upbringing, in sport, in the classroom, in your home that encouraged you to be willing to speak up when something felt actually unsafe to you? That's a good question. It's hard, it's right? Yeah. Because, and it's a really hard thing for us to teach because for a long time, we came at this from the mindset of our job is to be behind, nipping at their heels, pushing, 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 so that they can discover what true excellence lives inside them. But we have made it really clear that at some point that tips over to being really damaging and tying all of your, not just your identity, part of your identity, but all of your identity and your validation and your worth. And so when, not if, when you have to stop doing your sport. Because for periods of time and at some point, I mean, very few people pass away from old age while also currently being a professional athlete. <laughs> Yep. The, athlete, the professional or the you know, top elite athletic part of our life, and there are some amazing athletes who are you know, living their best life in, as octogenarians, but that is not the majority of us. So we imagine, we hope that our lives will be longer than our pouring all of our, most of our schedule, most of our hours into athleticism lives. That's a shorter period of time. So I'm gonna say when that piece ends, we've gotta still know who we are, and we've got to be whole. That's the goal, at least, to be whole after that transition, during that transition. So understanding how to say when you've gotten to a point where things are potentially dangerous, hang on, I don't need to just look at this differently. I need all the people, the constellations around me, my mentors, my support system, everybody to look at this differently. But how are you supposed to know when that is? And yet you've each done that at one time or another. What do you want to say, Trent? Yeah, I think one time that comes to mind was the summer of 2019. Uh, I was training for the World Championships, and it's the pre-Paralympic, pre-Olympic year, so that's when you qualify for the Games. A uh, ton of pressure. I just graduated from college. Um, I was living by myself in this dorm room, and I went through a really intense depressive episode for months. And again, I was just like, head down, I'm getting through this, I'm training for the national team, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go qualify for the Paralympics. Um, and I let it go on for way too long. I didn't open up to anybody, I didn't tell anyone. And I vividly remember one morning waking up and looking in the mirror and not recognizing myself. And you know, I'm, I'm this outgoing social guy, I love doing things, I love meeting people, and I didn't have the energy to do any of that, and I didn't enjoy it. And it was in that moment that I thought something, and unfortunately it was much too late, um, but I was like, something's wrong, and I, I really need to start addressing this. And fortunately, my coaches were incredibly supportive. Um, they helped me talk to a therapist. They allowed me to go home for a week. I went home um, and just got to be with my family for a week, which was huge. And it was just a really, really tough time. And I let it go on too far. I still don't have probably the right answer of when exactly to know you've crossed that line. It's really tough and it's different for everybody. Um, but for me, 
I didn't recognize myself anymore. And that really scared me. And that's when I realized that I really needed to, to do something to address this. That makes sense. Yeah, Jeff, yeah I, think, I think to Charlie's point, you know, it's, and, and again, I, I think I waited too long as well, because mine was after COVID, right? Like during COVID, obviously that was hard for everybody. But to your point, I was a social person. I liked being out. I, I loved waking up at five o'clock in the morning to go work out at six. And I know those people that were working in our gym hated seeing me because they're like, oh, Jeff's going to come in and his energy is going to be too hot. And it was hard for me to do that. <laughs> it was so hard for me to do that during COVID and after COVID. And I, I think, you know, to your point, you know, when you start to feel like you're not you anymore and, and we go back to your identity, right? Because if you identify as a athlete and I identified as a basketball player for a long time, that's who I was, right? So me being able to get up and go play was great. Like, okay, I'm okay. But being able to know that you're so much more than that is, I think, the biggest thing. Because then if you know you're an athlete, that's part of you, right? But you're also into finance, and you're also into music, and you're also into all this other stuff that you enjoy doing. If all that stuff, you, you know, see that stuff kind of dwindling away, you don't have the passion to do that stuff anymore, then okay, maybe you're like, hey, what is, what is really draining me? What is really draining me? And it's hard to see that, you know, for yourself, right? Um, so it goes back to having you know, someone trustworthy that you know you can go to, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a friend, whether it's a coach, to, to go to and be like, hey, I just, I just feel like it. Like, I don't know why I don't have the passion to go do all this other stuff anymore, right? Like, I know I still have to go do sports because that's what I, that's what I do, but like, what is it? And I think a lot of times we have to be okay saying as mentors, hey, it's probably the sport that you're playing that might be doing this. You know, maybe you should take a step back Take a break, like Charlie said, go see your family, do whatever it is, chill out and see if that makes a difference. And it's hard to recognize that if it's always been your answer, yeah. it's hard to recognize when it's actually currently part of your problem. Mm -hmm. We know that for teens who have five adults in their lives to whom they feel accountable and bonded, and I'll explain that in a second, that they're five times less likely to engage in risky behaviors in the teen years. So if they have five adults in their lives to whom they feel accountable, that means they know they can get in trouble with that person, and bonded, they care if they get in trouble with that person, then they're five times less likely to engage in risky behaviors. And you've each talked about some of those people in your lives, but I wanna ask each of you a different question. Your advice, because everyone listening is one of those five people for at least one, if not dozens or hundreds of student athletes. So, Killian, the question I wanna ask you is, what's your advice for those people to help that student that they're thinking of right now, that they're one of their five people, to know that their worth isn't predicated on their academic achievement. Because you said that you know that from some of your people. So what's your advice to them? How do they communicate that to that student? I think letting the student know, or the, the child, whoever it is, um, whether it's like a niece, a nephew, somebody you've met through your community, I think letting them know that your relationship with them and the foundation of that relationship has literally nothing to do with their sport, with what they do in the classroom, with Anything like these external validators that we use, it, it literally just has to deal with like the kind of person that they are. And I talk about this one amazing mentor that I have who's one of my best friend's mothers and I feel like my relationship with her is totally independent of my relationship with her daughter. And for me, like when I'm walking around my town and I'm walking around like different things, even when I'm at school, when I'm, when I'm posting on social media, I, I really do think like does this hold up with how I want my mentor, like her, to see me? Does this hold up for how I want, like, the kind of person that sh I know she believes that I am and that I can be? Um, because I think sometimes we think of, like, you were talking about this whole person and, like, feeling really whole. And I think what a lot of um, adults, where they misstep, is, like, making a child think that adding like a, you being a great athlete or you being a really wonderful student, you being X, Y, Z, that those actually are what complete you when really like you're born whole and you will die whole and the actual thing is whether or not you believe that. And so if you believe the thoughts that tell you and if you believe the people that are projecting onto you that like these things are actually, they're not supplementary. They're actually adding, they're they completing you, 
then you're always gonna feel drained. Like Jeff said, you're always gonna feel like you're missing something because you don't believe that you're whole in and of yourself just as a human being who is breathing. Like before you can talk, before you can walk, you are whole and you matter. And then you add all of these wonderful, I like to think of it as like bedazzling. Like I've bedazzled my life with all these things. Like with sports. That's a very Hannah Montana. I know, that was <laughs> unintentional. But I've added these things, like I've added sports and school and all these passions of mine and hobbies. And they're amazing and people do associate me with them just naturally because people love to, to label people and understand them in a way that is more digestible for them and has nothing to do with you. But also, I do understand that if all of these things got taken away, I still live this deeply rich life because of who I am and because of who I've allowed myself to become. And my dad even said the other day, and I think this kind of echoes the point about the five adults, is like having a rich life actually has nothing to do with the money that you have or the accolades or the reputation or the status. It really is like if you had 365 incredible friends, even if you had 10 incredible friends, you could probably live a year with no money, with no food, and people would house you, and people would feed you, and you would be completely fine, you'd be safe. And so to live that kind of rich life and to know that you've created a community with like those five mentors who don't care, like I, I don't even know what my mentor does for a job, to be honest with you. Like I couldn't tell you how much money she makes, I couldn't tell you her title, but I still think she's one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. And so she feels the same way about me and she doesn't even know what position I play. Like, I, it's really amazing to form those relationships with people and to create a rich life through the community of telling people, like, I don't care at all about what you do in the classroom, what you do on the field. I really genuinely care about your mind, your heart, and the kind of person you are and how you treat people and the integrity you show up with in that sense. And so I hope that was, it was a bit of a monologue, I'll be honest, but I think that is where I feel like I've gained the most value of learning, like, the the value of establishing those relationships and actually maintaining them is like the respect that has nothing to do with the external things that I do. Like if we stripped it all away, I would still have that foundation. Um, and I think so as an adult communicating that is like, oh yeah, cool, like you're kind of, we talked about this yesterday, like you're driving home from the game and you're in the car, right? You get like, how cool is it as a parent to get like a, a 40 minute drive home from a tournament or a game with your kid? Like that's a really special time. Like my, my parents and I established the most beautiful relationships in those car rides because I, they weren't talking to me about lacrosse. They were I'm like, ah, that shot you missed went right to the goalie. Like I would have been like, oh God, get me out of here. But we talked about other things like, oh my gosh, imagine we had another road trip where they asked me about school or they asked me about like, you know, what I want to look for in a college and things like that. And so when you have this time with the people that you love, like you don't need to ask them about sports. You don't need to ask them about school. If they bring it up, by all means, like engage with that. But I think establishing a relationship based on mutual respect and mutual love, just at the base of like my soul likes your soul and it rocks, um, is really <laughs> valuable. So my shorter listening in that is that you're good with them judging how you behave you want to know that they're not focused on your achievement, like your output in terms of successes. And it brings me to a question that I want to ask you, Charlie. For a lot of times, the people who are at least one or two of those five people in a kid's life, they are there to interact with them about their sport, or they are there to interact with them about their academics, like that's their role. I'm your academic advisor, or I'm your coach. So what are things that you would caution not to or encourage those people to say about like the, the competition, whatever that looks like in your sport, just finished. And however it went, what can you say in that moment that either builds that relationship and makes that, that athlete feel more bonded and accountable to you, or cautionary if you'd prefer what not to say, what to avoid? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, and honestly, I think a lot of, these conversations it's important to have happen before the result ever comes. I mean, I think about my mom who's in the audience, love you mom. Um, <laughs> she, she's like my biggest fan and I was going into selection camp and for rowing, we have about a month long selection camp before world championships, before Paralympics. Um, it was the one pre-Paralympics and just by nature of it, you're gonna be really nervous, you're gonna be anxious, you know, you commit your life to this thing and then, you know, in the next, two days, you're gonna be racing for this spot. Do you win, do you lose? And I vividly remember 
talking to my mom one day. I mean, she obviously, even though we were on other sides of the country, she knew that I was nervous and I was going through it. And she told me, uh, Charlie, like, I'll love you no matter what happens, whether you make the team or not. And it was really, it was so simple, but it was so impactful because I then had to talk to myself. I was like, well, Charlie, like, will you love yourself if you don't make this team? You know, and, and it, it realized it helped me start those conversations with myself and then with friends that we were training together. Um, and again, I think it's really important to establish that before any sort of competition. Um, because like win or lose, the person is still there. Uh, and no sort of result, no medal, no making a team changes who that person is. And if you really do want to be a mentor and want to be a strong ally to this person as they grow up, it's so important to honestly put sport on the back burner because it really is, as you were saying, it's a person to person thing. And that's where so much of like, you can really instill values, you can really change someone's life. Uh, if they know that like really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what place you come in, it doesn't matter what team you make, what scholarship you get, whatever it might be. Thank you. And I'm gonna come to you, Jeff, with our last question on this, but after I do that, we're gonna have about five minutes. So if anybody who's watching online or anyone in the audience has a question that you'd like to ask, get that ready in your mind, please. And we'll get a microphone to you if you're here so that people online can hear you, not because we think people in athletics can't project. <laughs> Jeff, you're in the position now of mentoring. Yep. You work with students, and you're not talking to them about their sport. You're trying to get them to picture, maybe not past their sport, but at least past wherever they're at in school now, past high school, because, and think about their financial future, which is a real like record scratch for a lot of people. Like, you want me to think about what? Yeah. What do you do or say to help some of those students understand why you even care? about them outside of their sport or outside of how they identify the one shiny thing about them? Yeah, uh, well, I'll keep it brief. I, I want to bring up my dad one more time because I think it builds the foundation for me. So my dad's this big dude. Like, I'm a big dude. My dad's a big dude. He's like 6'5", like 250. He was a big dude back in the day. So he would always do these speeches, and I'd go watch him, and he, the first thing he would say to everybody in the crowd would be like, hey, he, you know, he'd be walking up down, and be like, hey, turn to the person next to you and tell them you love them. You know, and I think, just something, you know, I, as a kid, I was like, Dad, stop. Like, that makes people uncomfortable. Don't That's do that. That's cringy, yeah. Right, like, stop, Dad. But then he'd go up and grab somebody and grab probably the smallest person, someone like Kayleen's size, and be like, hey, I love you. You know, and I think him doing that, because he was talking to a lot of athletes, a lot of kids that, you know, had, you know, identified as an athlete, and for them to see that and kind of shock him a little bit, be like, hey, this guy doesn't even know me, but he's telling me he loves me, right? And I think where I'm coming in at is, you know, from that foundation, like I, I love these people and I love these kids more than what they can do on the court, on the field, more than what they can do in the classroom as a person, right? Like I, I see the potential that all these people have and I know that, you know, we're gonna work hard and they're gonna work hard and they're gonna try to reach all their athletic goals, but whether it's by their choice or by somebody else's choice, sports are gonna end for all of us, right? And I want you to be as prepared as possible for when that time comes. Right, because you know, we were having a conversation this morning, even professional athletes, you know, they get to this point, they start making some good money, and they're like, hey, I, I don't know what to do with it. You know, everything around me is telling me to spend my money. And then they, that day comes, and then they're like, hey, I don't have anything to show for it. Right? So I think it really just you know, starts at that foundation of love, but really just looking at the potential for what could be afterwards and when that day does come. I've really heard from all of you in different ways talking about how in tough love, it's the love that's impactful, mm -hmm. a lot less than the, t a lot more than the tough part is impactful. Yep. Okay, what questions do we have? Yes, sir. We need a microphone to you, give me one second. It's, somebody is moving very quickly. So you are clearly success stories here, and, and of course we're working to create more of you. And, uh, and we've talked about your personal journey, we've talked about your support systems, but what we need to do is institutionalize a, a culture and a system that, that provides the kinds of things that you've benefited from. So if you were an athletic director in a high school or a college, what would you do to put the kind of system in place that would lead to you? 
So if you had that job, what's one thing, because we don't probably have seven hours to answer this question, what is one thing that you would consider really important that you would walk in first day and say to your staff, here is a thing, and that's just going to be how we approach this one piece of interacting with our athletes? Anybody? That's a great question. <laughs> I think it's really important to shift the culture around this. And just by nature of you guys being here today or watching this from home, like you guys are gonna be those people. You're here, you care. So finding ways to have conversations with your staff, with the people that are working with these athletes to make sure that they're caring, that they're knowledgeable, that they're empathetic, I think are essential because a lot of the times as adults, we can be a little bit dismissive of kids going through high school, which is fair. A lot of the things I went through in high school don't matter at all today. And I think a way to kind of highlight that is I don't necessarily remember all of the stressors or all of the things that were making me anxious or whatever it might be, but I do remember the emotions. And I do remember how strongly I felt those emotions. So if we can foster this environment in which it's okay for kids to talk about it, it's okay for them to be vulnerable, I think that's essential. And if I could try and get that conveyed to my staff, to whoever was gonna be dealing with these athletes, that's what I would really try and hit home. Okay, so the one thing, and, and I'm seeing a lot of nods, and I wanna have time to get to another question, especially if there's one online, but what I'm really seeing you guys all endorse is emotions are gonna have a place here, and we're not gonna make rules about what you feel. We have tons of rules in the world, but especially in athletics, about how you behave, but we're not gonna have rules about how you feel. And I would say that we have to remember as adults, one of the worst things about being an adult is if we want something, we have to model it. It's like super annoying, right? It'd be so much easier if we could just be like, be this, but I'm gonna be over here not being that. <laughs> and so if what we're gonna say is, be an athlete who knows how to express how they're actually feeling in a vulnerable way, they are never gonna do that unless we're willing to do that as well. And yes, there are ways to do that and be professional, which in our last panel of the day, we're gonna talk about when we talk about solutions. Do we have any questions from online? Not right this second. Okay, we have one right back there. Hello, could any of you speak to the power or impact of having access to a peer or a mentor or a support person outside of your sport? Awesome, anybody wanna talk about that? Yeah. I'll take it. Um, I think, you know, when you have a peer mentor outside of your sport, I think, you know, we talk about one of the five people, right? A lot of those people are going to be within your sport, a coach at some point, um, even like a parent is involved, right? Um, but being able to have somebody that you can kind of just completely disconnect from your sport with, I think is huge. I think, you know, to our point, sports can be a lot. Sports can be a lot. And if the only people we can go to are other people that understand sports, and we're just going to end up talking about sports. And I'm sure you guys all know, like, basketball players love, and I'm, it's the same with every sport, but basketball players love talking about basketball. Jeff, did you watch that game last night? Oh, what about this guy? What about this person? I'm, I'm like, hey, can we talk about something else? <laughs> can we please talk about something else? So I think to your point, it's, it's so crucial to have somebody that you're comfortable with talking about other things, right? And it could be about your other passions, or it could just be somebody that, hey, is just around. You know, just to be able to get it out and say, hey, you know, I know you might know me from the basketball court. Like, you may come to the games, but, like, I don't want to talk anything about that right now. Um, so I, to, to, your, to your point, I think it's, it's huge, right, to be able to have somebody in that spot. And if you're a coach, you know, maybe that's not you. And maybe you have other people that are around you that you know are good people that you can, you know, introduce your student athletes to. Like, hey, this is my best friend from back in the day. He does X, Y, and Z right now, or she does X, Y, and Z. And, you know, obviously it's going to take a minute to build that relationship if you do it that way, but it could just be a way to, to continue providing good mentors for these kids. And Jeff, proof of concept, last night Dr. Williams and I were talking and I asked her about the professional athletes that she's working with in, in the NBA, even the most high profile ones, who are their people? And she said, oh yeah, everybody that I see that is supporting their own mental health well, they have a person or more people on their own bench who have known them and have known them when they were doing well, have known, known them when they weren't doing well, or have known them in so many ways that have nothing to do with their sport and are willing to speak truth to them about their behavior, about their situation, and see their value that has nothing to do with how they are doing in their sport. And, and so that is 
a real prognostic indicator for success from the point of view of mental wellness. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you all to join me in thanking these athletes for lending their voice to this important conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh.